right, well, I am Karen Hetler, for those of you that may not know me. I'm the MC today for our Lunch and Learn. Welcome, everyone. I am Wendy's understudy, because Wendy's normally the Lunch and Learn girl, and I'm her understudy today. So um, we are welcoming uh, Dr. Craig Anderson. He's one of our general surgeons, has been with Grand River since 2016. Is that correct? Okay, I think so. <laughs> and, uh, so he is going to... Uh, teach and educate us today on the variety of general surgery services that are provided here at Grand River and the unique relationship that Grand River has with the general surgeons of Western Colorado. So join me in welcoming Craig Anderson. Well, thank you guys for being here. And, and what, I'm, uh, what I had planned to do here was to kind of talk about our, our general surgery service just to review how it works here because it's kind of an unusual uh, uh, situation that we have in that uh, the general surgeons are not based here in Rifle, but we, we uh, commute here from Grand Junction. And uh, so I want to kind of describe how that works, how we cover this hospital and cover the general surgery service. And then... Uh, what I want to do after that is kind of just go through all the different things that all the different services we provide and procedures that we do and answer any questions about those and you know any questions that you have about general surgery even if you're just curious about something feel free to to ask it would be cool to have this be an interactive type of thing and then um, you know if you have any feedback or any suggestions about how we're doing I'd be happy to hear that too so first of all, uh, in case you're not familiar with what general surgery is, it's a, you know, a long list of things that we do, like hernias and gallbladders, appendix, endoscopy, all kinds of intestinal surgery and stomach surgery. And uh, we do breast surgery, uh, mostly pertaining to breast cancers and breast lumps. And then uh, some of us do thyroid and parathyroid surgery. And uh, then we do the whole gamut of kind of skin cancers and lipomas and, and cysts and things like that. So, and who are the surgeons here? Well, uh, we're with General Surgeons of Western Colorado, and we're an independent group in Grand Junction. We have, we're, we're a private practice. We, we are affiliated with St. Mary's, and the, you know we do most of our work down there at St. Mary's, but we're not owned by St. Mary's, and we're not we're not agents of St. Mary's, we're independent, and we're, uh, we're just hired by Grand River to, to, to provide the general surgery service here. And we have a pretty big group, we have 14 of us uh, down there, and we have a lot of uh, diversity and variety and things that we do and what people specialize and whatnot. And there's a smaller group of us that rotate regularly here, I think it's currently seven, and, and then the rest of them um, just help with night call and, and weekends and things like that. So it is kind of a, an unusual relationship, you know, that, uh, that they just, that uh, Grand River hires us uh, part time. And the way that our coverage works is we generally have two surgeons here each week. Um, we do, uh, each of us will do four days out of the five. And we're doing, you know, the whole comprehensive service. We do, we do clinic, and we're doing OR procedures and ER calls and anything urgent that comes up. And uh, we do cover, you know, 365 days a year and 24 hours a day. So, so we're always available. Anybody have any questions about how all that works? No. Do you rotate when you have two surgeons? Like, um, of the seven of you, are you here? Yeah, it works out so that each of us are that that do it are about one third time. So it's going to you know average one in three weeks. Okay. So you know one or two weeks a month, each of us will be here. Other than Grand Grand River and St. Mary's, are there other Western Slope uh, hospitals that? This group works yeah, we uh, we uh, cover the VA hospital also. We used to do more at community, but we're not there very much anymore. And uh, we do a little bit down in Delta, mm -hmm. 
and in Furuta at, at Family Health West. So, but this is a, um, well, this and the VA are our main other ones other than, than St. Mary's. And at the VA, we cover the, the entire service there too. They don't have any of their own surgeons there either. So, and the, that relationship has some real benefits, you know, it, uh, it kind of gives us, it gives Grand River a real depth of coverage. So in the sense that if one of us, you know, gets hurt or retires or leaves or whatever, then somebody else will just fill the spot, you know, so it's, it's real stable and, and uh, reliable that will, you know, that will always be uh, providing coverage here. And then uh, we do have, a, a, like I said, a lot of diversity of special interests and things that people do. So we have a lot of uh, breadth of expertise. We can pretty much do anything that, that is general surgery. The disadvantages are that, you know, with that higher number of surgeons, you got a lot more people coming and going. And so you don't necessarily get to get as familiar with each of the surgeons that comes here as you would if you only had, you know, three or four that, that are here uh, full time. And the same goes for the surgeons. They're not always, you know, as familiar with the hospital as, as you know, would be otherwise. Um, and then the, you know, the commute here can, can be a little um, awkward at times because it's hard for us to just kind of drop into the ER and check something out on a Sunday afternoon, you know, it, it requires a, a trip up here and, you know, and if we have somebody in the hospital and something's going on, it can be a little tough for us covering that over the phone and stuff. So, so it does have some disadvantages. Um, so, uh, if you don't have any questions about all that, I'd like to kind of just talk about the you know, the all the things that we do. So we do all kinds of hernia repairs. Uh, those are real common groin hernias and ventral hernias, and we do them open, or what I call the normal way, and we also do them uh, laparoscopically. Um, we do, you know, of course, uh, gallbladders and appendectomies, and those are real common that we do those through the ER, and, uh, people come in acutely for those and you know we can do you know bowel obstructions and perforated colons and ulcers and all kinds of stuff like that that comes in through the ER um, and we do do endoscopy we've been doing a lot of colonoscopies here uh, and we do upper endoscopies too one thing that we don't uh, do much of is the urgent or emergent uh, endoscopy because that's kind of specialized dealing with bleeding ulcers mm -hmm. um, there's special techniques of coagulating ulcers and whatnot that general surgeons don't typically get a lot of experience with but all the diagnostic stuff uh, we do and then uh, we do a lot of uh, abdominal surgery, like I mentioned. We can do colon cancer and polyps, and we do bowel obstructions. Uh, we do hiatal hernias and, and uh, what, what's called foregut surgery, which includes bariatric surgery. Mm -hmm. And uh, that can get pretty specialized. And um, Dr. Hanish was uh, our real expert in that, but he has recently retired. But we have Dr. Welsh now, who's, who's fellowship trained in bariatric surgery and foregut surgery, and he's been doing real well, so we, we, we really have that covered. Do you do that here? No, we, don't. yeah, we don't, and we've talked about it, and uh, in fact, I was talking with Dr. Coleman about it like a couple weeks ago, and uh, because Dr. Welsh is going to, he's our bariatric surgeon, or one of them is going to start coming up here more. And, um, you know, we talked about maybe doing bariatric surgery here, but it really requires a lot of resources, like kind of having the extra wide toilets. And, you know, there's a bunch of stuff that goes into it that apparently is required by, you know, various agencies and stuff. So. 
We can, yeah, yeah. And we're going to talk uh, in a minute here about where we do things. You know, some things we do and we would do in junction, and and, and uh, so and there's that's kind of an interesting topic. Um, so and then uh, we don't seem to get a lot of it here, but we're fully capable to to take care of. Uh, breast cancers and breast biopsies and whatnot. Um, we we do have you know a needle localization biopsy is a is the real common way to do breast biopsies when things are seen on mammogram, and that requires uh, specialized radiology capabilities. But the, the radiologists here can do that, and so we can we can do uh, those here. Uh, the one thing we don't have covered with, with breast cancer surgery is immediate reconstruction. So if a woman has a, a, a mastectomy and they may have elected to have a, a immediate reconstruction by a plastic surgeon, we don't have that coverage here. So that, that's one thing we can't do here, but pretty much anything else with, with breast cancer we can do. Any questions about that or anything else? If not, then, uh, and I don't think a, a lot of people, or some people don't know how much uh, thyroid and parathyroid stuff we do, and we, we do a, a, a lot of that down in Grand Junction. That's actually my special interest. I do a lot of that. And uh, um, endocrinology is, is the specialty, medical specialty, that deals with thyroid and parathyroid stuff, and that's been real... Uh, scarce on the western slope for a number of years. So uh, myself and and Caleb Van Essen is a, you know one of my partners that's interested in this. We we see a lot of thyroid disease and parathyroid disease and even some of the not uh, non-surgical stuff since people can't get in to see endocrinologists and stuff. So so we're happy to help with any of these uh, thyroid and parathyroid. Things, even if it doesn't turn out to be a surgical thing. Some people think that's ENT, but it's actually general surgery, <laughs> in our opinion. And then, uh, like I said, we do all the kind of skin stuff and um, melanomas and lipomas and cysts and stuff. Some of that stuff we can do in the clinic even. So, Okay, so this is a, a topic that, that comes up sometimes, which is we'll see a patient here and their surgery will end up getting done down in, at St. Mary's. And, and uh, so people sometimes wonder what's going on there, you know, and, and uh, there are just uh, some things that are better taken care of at the at a higher level of care because of equipment reasons and patient acuity and special needs that the patient might have you know it comes up when people have you know bad heart disease or or bad copd and you know maybe we or anesthesia is feeling like we're probably going to want to have more resources available to do that operation um, if we have somebody in the ER that's going to potentially be unstable afterwards, you know, like uh, in the ICU and real sick and whatnot, we may transfer them down there for that reason. Um, and then, you know, we obviously have a, a, a great lab here and other specialties and stuff, but where these things come up, the resources is... Uh, Sometimes with pathology, we need what's called a frozen section, which is where you have to have a pathologist on site. We send all our pathology to uh, Glenwood from here. So uh, we, that comes up a lot in the thyroid and parathyroid stuff where we need a pathologist to look at something right, right away. So, so for that reason, we'll do a lot of those down at St. Mary's. And then the lab uh, issue also relates to the endocrine stuff because there's a, a, a blood test, a parathyroid hormone or PTH that um, we will do that during the surgery and we need a real quick time, uh, turnaround on that and 
I think uh, Grand River sends their PTHs to Glenwood and it takes, you know, a couple days or something. So, so that's why some of that stuff gets done down there. And, and, you know, we have a relatively small blood bank. So if we have somebody that's, you know, bleeding out from a trauma, then they'll go down to, to Junction and, and other traumas go down there because of, you know, they need neurosurgery or uh, uh, ENT for their facial fractures or whatever. And then uh, robotics is, is a big uh, thing going on now. So there's kind of a, a revolution going on with general surgery where more and more surgery is being done ro robotically, which if you don't know what robotics are, it's kind of a little bit confusing, but it's, it's more like remote control surgery, you know, where the surgeon is working on a console and the, the robot is inside the body and it's kind of uh, duplicating their movements and uh, uh, most of the the younger surgeons are trained with robotics and it's really for a lot of the operations they do that's their preferred way of doing the operation and and more and more people are feeling that that's the best way to do it and that's uh, true of most of the a lot of the colon resections these days and some of the hiatal hernia stuff is being done that way. And so it's a little bit of a, a kind of an awkward moment right now because we'll see somebody up here and we'll feel like the, pa the patient would be best served to have their operation robotically. Mm -hmm. And so then it get, ends up getting done at St. Mary's. And uh, Eventually, what's going to happen with that is that all hospitals are going to have robotics. And, uh, you know, we talked to Dr. Coleman about that. And it's just, you know, Glenwood has a robot and Montrose. I don't know if Delta has a robot or not, but, but everybody's kind of get, you know, community has robotic surgery. And so it's the wave of the future. And, and so that's uh, why, uh, you know, a lot of patients will, will, uh, end up, instead of having their surgery at Grand River, have it done down at St. Mary's ro uh, robotically. Sure. Is this uh, robot like one that does, like it's made to do all general surgeries, and it's kind of like a, or is it, are there different ones that are just like kind of one trick ponies for certain things or specialize in certain things? So I don't do robotic surgery myself, and Alero can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that it, it's all the same machine used for different specialties. Although there is some type of robotic thing for orthopedics that's different, right? Yes. For general surgery, there's one, there's one robot. They just came out with a newer version, the DD5, and the, the difference is not in the surgery, it's in sort of the surgeon conference. You can charge your phone you can, feel some, <laughs> you can feel the vibrations, you can feel sort of what you feel when you are touching the patient. Um, so that's the upgrade in the new robot, but it's the same robot for all sort of general surgery cases. Cool. And for urology and gynecology urology, too. Gynecology, yes, yeah, and that, that's the way that gynecology will, will is going too. I mean, eventually, the you know, when Grand River hires a new gynecologist, they're going to be like, "Well, where's the robot?" You know, they're going to they're going to want a robot. So, yeah. Uh, for those of you that were fortunate enough to get that school to get that during your schooling to learn on robotics throughout schooling, um, are you all trying to become kind of like trained? on the job to use the ro robotics now, or is there some people that are just like, I'm just sticking to doing it with my hands the old fashioned way? Or I'm just sticking to doing it with my hands because, you know, m the biggest reason for me is that the majority of my surgeries anymore are uh, thyroid and parathyroid surgeries. And the robotic, you know, they, there have been some experimentation with doing that robotically. Um, but it, it hasn't really caught on. It's not a standard of care. And so I don't really have any operations that are high volume surgeon or surgeries that I do where I would, it's worthwhile me getting trained. Plus I'm towards the 
latter end of my career, and so I figure I'd le leave it to the younger surgeons to do it. But a lot of people, like Alero, you you were trained on the job doing yes. it. You didn't yes. get it in your residency. So most residents that come out now have had um, some robotic experience. I ended up in that middle ground mm -hmm. where I trained with laparoscopy, you know, open surgery when needed. And I did robot, I started doing robotics here. Um, and essentially the company intuitive supports you. So you go for a course, you learn everything about the robot. You do cases on cadavers. And then you come back, there's a simulator, you practice on, you know, he's not human beings. Right. And then you start to do the case. The cases on the people. And so it's definitely something you can learn as an attending because you're already a surgeon. Um, it's just a new platform. It's a higher level of laparoscopy. The advantage is that the instruments are wristed as opposed to being just straight movement. So you can mimic what you would do with your hands and you have um, the benefit of working in smaller areas. So you can work in the pelvis better because it's narrow compared to laparoscopy. Um, you can do inguinal hernias better because it's also a narrower space. You can do ventral hernias better, also a narrower space. So things like that. But there, there are others. There are a good number of surgeries that are equivalent um, laparoscopically. Is it like a joystick, or is it like? Um, I can show you a picture at the end, but okay. essentially we're sitting in the console, you have your eyes, you're looking at your own um, view, and then it's like two Velcros around each, uh, around two fingers on each side. And so you do that and the robot does that inside the patient. Oh, cool. yeah. Pretty much. So when we say inside the patient, like what's, the, what's the size that we're talking about of, of the robot? It's small enough to be. So the robot itself is huge. Each instrument is just a, a straight, like laparoscopy, it's a straight instrument. So it's um, thinner than my finger once inside the patient. And then the tip of it is what's wristed and moves, like your hand moving. So it goes in through the same type of small laparoscopic incisions that we use for regular laparoscopy. And like she said, the robot's big, and then it has sort of like arms, arms. That, that go in through small incisions, and then the moving parts are on the inside, on the end of those arms. That makes sense. How remote can you be? Are you on premises, you or can, be can you be? Pretty remote. For the most part, we're in the room, so you have a thing. You're sitting right there, and the patient is here. Okay. Um, but I mean, they you have the capability of controlling from elsewhere. From anywhere. Can mm -hmm. you say house? <laughs> no, we just going remote. Now you could work from home doing it. <laughs> Future of medicine. Right. Just, thank you, Dr. Anderson. Just a comment. It's validating to hear your comments about the importance of the robotics. We just had the same discussion with the board last Wednesday for our five year capital plan. We have put robotics on there. And some of the comments were that very same reason uh, from our providers saying that you know, with newer providers coming on, it's like, really mm -hmm. going to be difficult to recruit or to stay yeah. up to date with, with what the tools people are expecting. But they're on our, our five year capital plan, but they're, I think, uh, one is like 2.9 million or something. That's extremely expensive. Yeah. And yet it's becoming a necessity. But you know, they, they have quote-unquote payment plans where you get the, <laughs> No, I'm serious. You get the robot and then you pay per use until you get to that tool. Well, so it doesn't have to be a... Because I know if I put our NICO, if we reach a certain threshold, the cost goes down. Right? Hundreds? Is that a magic number? Something like that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so anyway, thank you for... I just thought maybe people would sure. need to know that we are trying to figure out a cover for yeah, and I think Dr. Coleman mentioned that to me last time I talked to him, that it was a f kind of a five-year plan that you guys were looking at, so, yeah. Unrelated to robotics, um, when somebody gets transferred is, because let's say, I don't know whether, maybe it's in the middle of something where we're like, hmm, would, would you guys go with the transfer or would it just be the patient going to, like, 
you know, St. Mary's and then whatever surgery is on call. Yeah, so if we transfer somebody here, like as an emergency, you know, that maybe they're here and we, they need emergency surgery and we're transferring them, they go down to whoever, you know, my partner would be that's on call down there at the time. Which is, it's kind of a good system because I can just call them and tell them, you know, this is coming and this is exactly what's going on and stuff. And it's, it's kind of a pipeline, you know, that, that we can get them, you know, smoothly transferred down there and transfer their care from one surgeon to another. Is there any time that you would be transferred with them? Probably not. Yeah, well, there, I, I had one case where, you know, I went down and helped my partner with the case, you know, that I couldn't get it done up here. I actually tried to do it up here and, and uh, couldn't get it done in the middle of it. And we had to transfer the patient. I went down there and, and it was Dr. O'Day and I uh, finished it down there. So that, that, that can happen, you know, if, it, if, it, if it's appropriate. Um, so if, if they're being trained on robotics now, does, are they also being trained on how to do it with their hands? Like if they, I, mean, I would just, it makes me nervous to think, <laughs> only do that, I mean, what happens if it's not working? Yeah, well, that it's been an it's been an interesting you know evolution through my career because because I got trained uh, both laparoscopy and open, so I did gallbladders with both the incision and laparoscopically, and then so I was comfortable doing it both ways, and then uh, you know gradually it came so that a lot of the surgeons being trained weren't real comfortable doing them open, you know, because they just weren't doing them that way. And then, uh, and now it's kind of, we, we uh, one of our newer partners that we hired, you know, when we were interviewing him, he was really wanting to do most things robotically, but we didn't really have enough robots at St. Mary's, you know, to cover all the cases at the time. And, and he said, well, uh, you know, I could do some of my ventral hernias laparoscopically, but I might need help getting used to doing them that way. So it's mm -hmm. kind of like, you know, it's people get used to whatever instrumentation they're the most familiar with, but they're always going to be able to do stuff with their hands because we, we all get trained, uh, you know, in emergency surgery. And when we're, when we're doing a trauma case or a perforated uh, colon or some bad belly thing going on, or th those are usually being done open with a big incision and so so all general surgeons are still getting training in in open surgery and laparoscopic surgery they might it's not it might not be their choice you know that might what they're the most comfortable with but they still get trained in it open is still the bailout plan for anything that, <laughs> for anything you can accomplish robotically or laparoscopically we, we, we're all comfortable <laughs> uh, Any other questions? Are you guys still doing ERAS? Are we doing what? ERAS. Yeah, you know, ERAS has kind of almost just become the norm now. You know, it's a, yeah, we have, there's a ERAS protocol for most things that, that we do. Yeah. Um, which has really kind of led to people getting out of the hospital like really quick. You know, it used to be a colon resection. We, we'd have people in for a week, you know, because of course we were doing those all open a long time ago. Now with the combination of the robot and uh, ERAS, that's enhanced recovery after surgery. Um, we have colons going home the day after surgery, you know, when they would typically be in for a week. Some of them we can send home right away, but it's frowned upon. Oh. <laughs> the day of, you mean? Or <laughs> so does that mean just trying to get somebody up and like moving and back to regular life as soon as possible? Is that what ERAS is or is it different for every surgery? Yeah, I mean, the, yeah, the whole idea, it, uh, yeah, it's optimizing pain control and it's optimizing, you know, hydration 
and uh, optimizing mobility. Um, with general surgery, a lot of it's bowel function, you know, that because, you know, with an open surgery, uh, it takes a, quite a while for the GI tract to get working again, but with less trauma, you know, and less invasive surgery, and then certain medications, the GI tract will get to working, you know, a lot quicker. So they don't need that support in the hospital. Did you have a question, Dr. Brock? Are you guys doing any uh, weight loss surgery here? No, not here. And we were talking about that before. That, you know, that, that day might come, be, but it, it requires a bunch of special resources. You know, like yeah. the one thing that sticks in my mind that Dr. Coleman men mentioned is having, you have to have like special wide toilets and you know, whatever else, I don't know whatever else it requires, but you know, there's a, there's a bunch of stuff that, resources that you have to have in place to do that. Does it require ICU? ICU? Yeah. Probably not. No, not, not for routine bariatric surgery. But a lot of them have a significant amount of comorbidities, and I feel like anesthesia might preclude them. Yeah, that's a possibility too. Yeah. Well, plus after anesthesia too, the, the pulmonology there, the cardiology, the, the people who tend to manage those comorbidities after surgery, yeah, those are the worst people to have that kind of surgery. A lot of things we could probably do, or we, but what we're done with it, then who's going to take care of the patient? And that's a problem that we have. That we always have, just because we don't have those those high um, acuity patients, and we don't have the physicians to take care of. Um, on our, we don't have them on our staff you know, that are available for work. Um, yeah, it's a type program where it requires the follow-up and the nutritional counseling, and like a whole bundle of care, or is that not always the model? That's kind of yeah, I think that's always the model. There's a yeah, that's a really good point that it's a whole it's a whole uh, system and team approach and stuff. There's a lot of uh, pre-op machine, machinery that goes into it. You know, dietitians and counseling and whatnot, and and afterwards too. It's, yeah, it's not just the operation. It's a, there's a lot of resources that go into it. You know, our healthy lifestyles can accommodate the post bariatric mm -hmm. surgery support, um, but as far as some of that other stuff, we've been interested. Yeah, so it's a lot that goes into a bariatric program. What else? Anything else? Anybody have any feedback? Anything you'd like to see happening? It doesn't happen. No, I just have, I can't say a positive feedback. I think from both being the inside person at the hospital and the quality um, and the, the kind of work that happens in the OR, as well as hearing from the employees or travelers that it's the best team I've worked with, the providers, the surgeons. I mean, it really stands out. I think it's one of our most outstanding services and hearing from the community that they're surprised in the number of services they can have here. They're not used to small hospitals getting to do all of that. And I think a lot of that's to the benefit of the um, partnerships that we have. And, and then of course, as a patient, just, you know, I think of my many family members who are living a much more enriched life because of the work that all of you do. So I'm, I'm Huge fan. So. No, thank you. Thank you. That's good to hear. You even made it to the Christmas party, so that was awesome, right? Last year. I didn't make it, but. <laughs> Some party. <laughs> I'll take credit for it, but I don't. I don't think I was there, but. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, thank you guys for listening and. Yeah, it was, it was good being here.